Hi everyone. We will uh, continue our uh, discussion on right to information. However, the topic for the day uh, today is going to be on Constitution of India and the right to do. As we are quite well aware of from our previous discussion, uh, we have come to this understanding that right to information is a fundamental right. Apart from being a fundamental right, it is a statutory right provided by the 2005 legislation enacted by the parliament. And uh, before 2005, be before it became a statutory right, which you can exercise through the Information Commission, this was a right that was granted to India uh, through the Constitution of uh, India, which is the fundamental law of the land. Uh, the Constitution of India, as we know in part 3, guarantees fundamental rights to its citizens. There are several fundamental rights that we are entitled to, including the right to equality, the freedom of uh, speech, expression, movement, business, or, you know, right to life, right to education, right to uh, religious institutions, uh, so on and so forth. So I think the Constitution of India fundamentally guarantees its citizens those rights that are necessary for uh, human development and those that are necessary to protect the democratic interests of citizens in this country. Now the constitution of India over a period of time, especially in terms of looking at how India has grown as an economy, as a legal system, as a democracy, has not only guaranteed its citizens those rights that are written in the constitution, but over a period of the past 65 years, the Supreme Court of India and various high courts have actually expanded the rights that uh, citizens are entitled to. There are a lot of rights that are read into, that are interpreted, those that are uh, uh, necessitated by the change that is required in the legal system. And hence, you will notice that the constitution becomes the fundamental law of the land, which actually enshrines citizens to get newer rights, to actually experience those kinds of, uh, you know, those kinds of ingenuities that they would require for their own development. And the right to know or the right to information as we uh, synonymously exchange and use, especially by reading the constitution, is something that the Indian judiciary has contributed to the Indian legal system. And hence today, we will try and analyze and uh, review the constitutional development on the right to know the constitutional development on how we have gone about our uh, uh, history in trying to understand and evolve this right and to look at the application of this right at several instances and several examples. So let's take this forward and in taking this forward, the first thing is an introduction that I would want to give it to you in terms of the importance of the right to know in our democracy. Right to know is nothing but Another way of looking at right to information, you want to know is something of a curiosity, is something that is a need of human beings to know and understand so that they can appreciate what is being done. And hence, in every democratic uh, institution, uh, you will know that government is made by the people. And hence, the real power of any democracy is within its people. And if you look at the preamble of the Indian constitution, we all know that it starts with the words, we the people. It means we the people have given this constitution to ourselves. It's a country, it's a government that we have chosen. And we think this is something that is good for us. And hence, finally, it is the people that are sovereign, the people that are supreme. And the government is just made to organize and believe in people's interest. And hence, it's the people that appoint the government. It is the people that dismiss them. And obviously, it is in the people's interest that any government of the day shares the information that is required by its people. So the accountability finally is taken by the people and the community and by society and hence every government must be answerable to what the people need and demand to know. And I think this is one of the most important principles that courts have time and again insisted upon and have actually uh, looked at administering through various decisions when it came before them. I think. When government does any function in a democracy, every function that the government does has to be tested on what it is good for its people and what is not good for its people. 
and hence i believe that every action and reaction of the government should be tested on the public interest or the public purpose test which means if any action or omission of the government is not serving public interest does not serve in the best interest of the people of this country then those actions and omissions can be negated and held to be unconstitutional and hence the constitutional test of every action in india becomes the most important test which means does it benefit the people is it in larger community interest and does do the people of this nation want that thing to happen or do don't they want that thing to happen i think this is where the constitutional test of rights the constitutional test of duties the constitutional test of what is good or bad is always something uh, that we are all uh, keenly observing especially in democratic system like ours it should also be noted that the courts have been established through the constitution and hence when we say the supreme court and the high court are constitutional courts it is because of the fact that the constitution actually creates them the constitution also empowers them so they are constitutional courts in the sense that they have the power to interpret the constitution they have the power to actually say what uh, or how to read the constitution and what does the constitution look in reality or in practice it is also important to note and understand that if we go by article 141 and 142 of the constitution of india we should come to this conclusion that the supreme court when it says something in its terms of judgments directions and orders it is considered the law of the land so the supreme court is empowered by the constitution to lay the law to state the law to interpret the law and that becomes a final basis on which we understand how rule of law place in this country and hence what the supreme court would ordinarily do is to check government actions to check government institutions and to see whether they have acted in public interest or whether they have not acted in public interest and what is the public interest test the public interest test is obviously the fact that does it serve the people of this country is it good or in the best interest of the people of this country if it is yes it is constitutional if it is no it is unconstitutional the two major institutions of governance in india are the parliament and the state legislatures especially when i look at state representatives who actually are supposed to make the law for its citizens the constitution uh, promises uh, its people free and fair election because obviously you need to have a vibrant democracy in this country and a vibrant democracy can only come to existence if there is free and fair elections and hence i think over a period of time in india we have successfully been able to protect the institution of elections and try and ensure that india has free and fair elections in the sense that those who are in the legislature both either at the state or the center are actually representing the people's mandate they represent people's aspiration they represent what the people uh, uh, look forward to in terms of the law that can be made to govern them and in the constitution also protects the institution of the legislature it actually makes the legislature autonomous and independent it lays down those processes in which the legislature can be brought into place finally please note the parliament and the legislature are then thereby accountable to the people at large and hence when you are talking about good governance it is not only about a robust uh, judiciary that is being aspired for it is also an independent autonomous fair uh, legislative body that one aspires for in terms of creation through the principles laid down in the constitution of india and hence armed with information the citizens are capable of participating in the process of government decision making and policy formulation and hence it is very important that once information is granted to the citizens they are capable of demanding the right answers they are capable of asking the reasons for decision making i think in a true democracy unless people have been empowered to ask the right and relevant questions unless people are informed why a decision is being taken i don't think a democracy will survive over a period of time democracy is based on the continuous communication that flows from the government to its people it flows from the fact that in a democracy the citizen can demand accountability from the government and the government has to answer to the interest of the citizen so this is like a two flow method it's a flow of information which actually bridges the gap between the government and the governed it bridges the gap of communication that is required it actually builds about a trust in 
the government that actually gets the power to rule on its citizens. And hence, I think the constitution is governing the law between the government and its citizens. And the constitution is that document that lays down that fundamental norm, the fundamental law. And without the constitution, I do not think the government and its citizen can move anywhere forward because that is the fundamental document, the fundamental law that governs the principle, the relationship between the two institutions. The constitutional entitlement to right to know has been there for quite some time. However, uh, the right to know obviously came about after we received independence. Prior to independence, we had a colonial government. It was not the government of the people. And hence, probably we least expected a British colonial government to actually share information with the people of India. However, post-independence, when we adopted the parliamentary system of uh, democracy, we did realize that it is the people who would have finally uh, created the system of law, have adopted the constitution and have gone about the rule of law and the social justice platform that was necessary for our country to actually grow about. And hence, having chosen the kind of government, having chosen the kind of development, the social justice development model, I think the people of this country laid the path to what the government must do and what the government need not do. I think it was a choice that our founding fathers who adopted the constitution and who adopted the constitutional principle were very clearly given that option. So post independent, I think we decided what kind of law, what kind of development we actually wanted to do. And I think it was very important that when we develop this kind of a democratic principle, we must have adopted a principle where the government could be held accountable to its people. And hence the kind of Post-independent India, the liberal independent India that we are speaking about, believes in government that is open, believes in a government that respects the rights of its citizens, believes in performing its duties under the rule of law principle, believes in the equality of the system, believes that it is important that overall development, especially social, cultural and economic, must be the basis on which the government goes about its daily functions. And hence, I think the constitution is a reflection of those aspirations. The aspiration of the forefathers that was there and adopted in the year 1950 as we uh, came uh, from the colonial rule into an independent rule, but also in terms of the fact that it was an aspiration that is continuous. And hence you do not expect the constitution to be a static document. You expect the constitution to reflect the aspiration of every generation. You expect the constitution to be a dynamic document. And hence what was adopted in 1950 need not be the same. Basically, the basic structure of the constitution continues to be the same. That cannot be changed. However, I think the aspiration of every generation gets reflected in the way the constitution is adopted, the constitution is interpreted. And hence, the principal rule of constitutionalism or how the constitution works actually reflects the current generation. The millennium generation has different aspirations from the constitution. And hence, if I look at the new aspiration of the current generation, I think the constitution actually is a reflection of the same. And right to know is probably the new aspiration that we require in this current generation. The Supreme Court of India, the apex court or what we call as the final authority on the constitution over the years has been continuously developing the rule of law. Now, what does rule of law say? It means that law is to be administered as it is and it cannot change to who it is. So it's not ruled by men, it is ruled by law. And hence, when I talk about rule of law in India, it means the law must be equally applicable to all citizens. And hence, it is important that discretion or administrative orders must not be arbitrary, unfair or unreasonable. And hence, whenever governments of the day turn out to be arbitrary, unfair or unreasonable, then obviously you cannot have a surviving democracy. You will have a system which is exploitative in nature and probably results in more violence and not peace. In India, I think over a period of time, the rule of law on freedom of information or freedom of speech and expression, as we talk about in Article 19, as we know, the Constitution of India divides its parts into articles. And Article 19 is uh, a, a sec, uh, is, is, is a section in part 3 of the constitution. Part 3 talks about fundamental rights and article 19 is a part of that. And article 19 has several freedoms uh, uh, that are 
freedoms of speech, expression, movement, uh, of association, so on and so forth. And freedom of speech and expression is the first freedom that is enshrined in this article. Free speech is an important aspect of a human being. A human being aspires to express. A human being wants to speak. This is part of his freedom and this is enshrined in the constitution. It's a privilege that is given to you. However, please note that it's not an absolute privilege and under article 92, there are reasonable restrictions on free speech as well. However, one needs this kind of a freedom. Then you have right to life as enshrined in article 21 of the constitution, which probably is the most dynamic article. Right to life has meant or uh, interpreted to mean so many different facets, including right to education, right to clean and healthy environment, right to health, so on and so forth. And the third most important aspect for our discussion under this course is Article 32, which talks about the right of every citizen to approach the Supreme Court of India for the infringement of his or her fundamental right. The constitutional remedies are very important because uh, it protects fundamental rights to an extent that a citizen need not go to different other forums for adjudication of his infringement of rights, but can reach the Supreme Court, which is the apex court, to actually uh, look at adjudication of those kinds of infringement of his rights. These are well-known provisions in the constitution. They only add impetus for our understanding on the course on right to information. As I told you previously, when you look at the constitution of India, information is not listed in the seventh schedule. It is not uh, a, a subject that is defined or not allotted either to the state or the center. And hence, it is one of those that are residuary in nature, which is not mentioned. And hence, the state or the central government had an option to bring such a law, which can be then part of the freedom of speech and expression. And hence, when freedom of speech and expression becomes a constitutional guarantee, I think there are several rights under the freedom of speech and expression that actually are necessitated to actually make the freedom of speech and expression a reality. And one of those rights uh, which contribute to freedom of speech and expression is the right to know. Interestingly, when we look at the uh, you know genesis or the growth of rights, as we call that, over a period of time, say over a period of uh, past 70 to 80 years, I think rights have just uh, uh, grown. And every generation has had its own emphasis on these rights. Uh, if I look at it, our founding fathers uh, aspired for certain kinds of rights. Uh, then, you know, our fathers had uh, aspired for a different kind of rights. And currently, the new generation aspires for different kinds of rights. Because that is what the growth of rights theory actually contributes to. So, rights don't remain static. So, there is a different aspiration. There is a different requirement to actually experience rights as we move forward, as we grow as a community, as a legal system and as a country. And hence, just to give you an idea about the generation of rights as we have seen and as it has grown, let us just look at those kinds of generation of rights that came by. The first generation of rights that we fought for or for which our forefathers uh, really struggled and they wanted to experience this as a very important kind of uh, 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 development of their own contribution were civil and political rights. I think when the constitution was adopted, when we got independence from the British powers, I think the first thing that we did was to get political autonomy, political independence. I think this is very important. We wanted civil rights, civil liberties, those that are probably in terms of arrest, detention, bail, uh, the right to be produced before a magistrate within 24 hours. The basic aspects which dealt with uh, 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 how the state can actually infringe my liberties, what are the grounds, what are the fair rules. I think the civil and the political rights were the first generation of rights for which we as a nation, we as a, uh, a society actually went about uh, aspiring for. The second generation of rights, which means once we have achieved civil and political rights, once we have experienced civil and political rights, which means we have experienced a democratic uh, polity, we have experienced civil liberties, we know when the state can uh, uh, deny your liberties and on what rule of law. I think then we went about experiencing the economic, cultural and social rights. This is called the second generation of rights, where we wanted uh, a social development, where we wanted to experience our cultural rights. Cultural rights uh, could be in terms of uh, my art, my expression, my drama, my uh, 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 production of a film. Uh, it could be culture in the form of dance. It could be uh, any other form where, uh, you know, I would want to speak, criticize, uh, economic development, my right to do business, 
my right to flourish, my right to export, my right to move uh, across not only India but across the world. Uh, so all of these became our uh, priority as second generation rights. So once civil and political rights were achieved, uh, I think India started aspiring for economic, cultural and social rights and I think the Supreme Court from time to time did try and develop on these rights and granted to its citizens by interpreting the constitution to reflect the aspirations of that generation to give the second generation right. The third generation right are those rights that were uh, in relation to consumer rights where the consumer fought for uh, making the manufacturer accountable, liable. Uh, I think that was the third generation right that citizens in India as consumers demanded and aspired for. We also demanded for environmental rights where we wanted clean water, clean air. We wanted the state to actually control or regulate businesses so that your right to health, your right to environment is not damaged. And I think that third generation of right became very critical as we moved in the liberalization era post-1991. And finally, if I look and add in the third generation of right is the informational rights. And I think informational rights are very critical to holding government accountable. And right to information only means today in the digital era, I am seeking information at my fingertips, on my phone, on my laptop, through internet. And I probably get this information free of cost. Informational rights are of a huge mandate. They are of huge magnitude. And you will notice that informational rights also include privacy, it includes data protection, and so on and so forth. However, for our course, we are looking at informational rights as being the right to know, the right to knowledge, the right to seek information, the right to receive and right to transmit the same information across frontiers and beyond borders. That third generation of right is something that the millennium generation has fought for, has aspired for, and that is something that the Supreme Court from time to time, right from 1975, if I'm not mistaken, has granted to its citizens and continues to grant the same through the statutory enactment of the Right to Information Act 2005. Right. Let's now look at the judicial pronouncements on right to know. What we are trying to understand, friends, is the constitutional history on right to know. What the Supreme Court said before 2005, uh, how did the Supreme Court contribute to the domain on right to know, how did it take it forward, what were the challenges that India faced, and please note, some of the pronouncements that we see right now in terms of right to know, not some, but I think almost all, have great implication in understanding the Right to Information Act of 2005. Because the constitutional interpretation finally is the uh, best interpretation. It is having uh, uh, the precedence of law. It actually governs the manner and method in which the right to information is now administered. So the constitutional basis on right to know becomes the foundation to how the Right to Information Act is being implemented in the current state. And hence, we ought to understand the judiciary's involvement, the judiciary's contribution, uh, which I think has been very significant, which I think is very prominent. And let's try and look at how the freedom of speech uh, 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 contributed to Right to Know and how did the judiciary come about its business on the same. The first and the foremost case that we would have to highlight here is this Bennett Coleman versus Union of India case. Now this case uh, is critical because Bennett Coleman, as we all know, is uh, a newspaper agency. Uh, it is a, a journalistic uh, uh, journalism uh, company. Uh, uh, the Times of India is a major contribution uh, from Bennett Coleman. Apart from that, I think they have gone into visual uh, media uh, right now as well. Uh, Way back in 1972, they had a petition to the court on uh, uh, whether Article 19 money is something that is granted to only an individual or can it be granted to the public or to the press. Friends, I think uh, what is relevant and important for us to understand is there are rights that can be uh, given to individuals, but most of the rights can also be uh, exercised collectively as a group. And I think when the Supreme Court was deciding whether the press have certain freedoms, because generally when the press exposes a political party or a political uh, person, they naturally get threats. Uh, uh, they feel that their expression is curtailed. Uh, to what extent then can the press go about writing about individuals? Because remember, uh, when we talk about the colonial law that is still relevant and uh, important in India, 
we also talk about the law on defamation right so very often they not if you report about an individual uh, they immediately target you with the suit under which they say that you have defamed me and hence you should be liable to pay compensation so the press was literally kind of uh, fearing the defamation suits and they did not know to what extent they can go about writing about individuals about politicians about political parties and to what extent their freedom of expression in the media in the press is to be protected under the constitution so the benet colman case probably is one of the starting features on defining the freedom of the press as uh, the supreme court wanted it to be defined under article 191a now we all know that the press uh, has a public function the press informs the people the press gives information to the public and hence what the press does i would assume does for the benefit of the people and hence when the press is acting in public interest for public benefit i think it is important for uh, the court and the constitution to protect this institution right it is important for the court to give independence autonomy to this institution so that when finally the information through the press reaches the public it is a fair information it's not a biased information it's not uh, something that is instigated it is not something that is fabricated it is not something that uh, unnecessarily infuriates the public rather it feeds the public with the necessary information as necessary in public interest now in benet colman it was observed that the right to know is implicit uh, so explicit means something that is written implicit means something that is read into into the right of freedom of speech and expression and hence when the press is trying to enshrine trying to communicate trying to reach out the right to know to the public it is the duty of the government to protect that kind of institution called the press freedom and hence in this case you will notice that the government uh, should try and help the press the government should be more vocal the government should probably address the press with the necessary information so that the press then communicates that necessary information as authentic information to the public but if the government does not share that information with the public the press will have to probably imagine about that information and when they imagine about this information when they actually try and uh, 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 construct this information then that information becomes distorted and hence i think what the court said in this case is it is the duty of the government to share and disclose this information about what the government does so it is the duty of the government to actually uh, it must be it's one of its business in terms of having what is known as a, a, a press bureau information or some place where authentic information of the government is relayed to the press and the same is then relayed by the press to the citizens so this is something that the court did recognize in the benet colman case and for that the court said that if the government comes up with an order that either restricts or diminishes the freedom of the press then such a law may actually be not in public interest and hence the news print control order that was made by the government wherein they wanted to control uh, the kind of uh, 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 you know paper that was consumed the kind of sale that was being done uh, the kind of consumption that newspapers were doing somewhere you know the court felt uh, and suspected the fact that the government wants to control the media and hence they actually wanted to control how much of uh, you know sale or how much of distribution is happening about newsprints they wanted to actually bring this under some kind of control order the court said unfortunately such a control order is against public interest it is unconstitutional it infringes the printing houses right to uh, freely publish and circulate the newspaper and hence freedom of the press becomes implicit part of freedom of speech and expression of not only individuals but of the collective institution called the press so the court struck down the newsprint control order they said it's not constitutional and they said that this control order cannot uh, control the print uh, media as well finally what did the court hold in this case they said it is indisputable that the freedom of the press meant the right of all citizens so what is the press is the press is just a reflection of society and citizen to speak publish and express their views and the freedom of speech includes within its purview the right of all citizens to read and be informed i think it is important to note here when i talk about freedom of speech it is not only to speak but also to publish and express my views and where can i publish and express my views in those days in 1972 please note the only uh, platform on which i could publish and express my views was the print media was the newspaper 
and hence the freedom of speech if it has to be expressed it has to be expressed in the newspaper that platform needs protection that platform cannot be regulated and controlled by the government unless it was necessary to do so right that is what the benet coleman case actually uh, spoke about and i think it laid the foundation for freedom of press as we know under article 19 